Hi, I'm Sissy Graham Lynch. Welcome to Fearless, helping you have a fearless faith in a compromising culture. I'm glad you're with me today. And this episode is your episode. A few weeks back, I asked you to submit questions for me. And I'm so thankful because many of you did. There's some fun ones, there's some serious ones, but I'm excited to answer some of them today. So to help me answer some of your questions, I have asked my colleague, Phil, to help ask. So it wasn't as awkward of me asking the question and then answering it. Yeah, we don't want it to be awkward. So see, I'm glad to be here to, to help out however I can. So, Phil, thank you for asking. Are right, you ready to jump yeah, in? Yeah, let's do it. All right. First question is, do you have a medical background? Um, this is from Debbie Fox. And she says, in a lot of your travels overseas, you're seen in medical settings helping out. Debbie, you are not the first one to ask that. I get asked that all the time because a lot of my work with Samaritan's Purse, we are doing uh, medical trips. No, I have nothing to do medically um, in my background. I just love it. But I've always said if I could go back and change one thing, I would have gone to school to be a nurse or to be a doctor. And when I talk to young people, I encourage them all the time to think about it because on all the mission fields I've ever been on, I think that is the most powerful way to share the gospel and the love of Jesus Christ is through medicine. Hey, and that I just realized, Sissy, one, uh, we had another question from somebody who asked you what your major in college was. So if you just said if you could do it again, it would be that. But what was your major in college? Um, Well, it was PR and marketing, which I guess I kind of do, but don't really. I always wanted to be behind the scenes, but somehow with family. I've always gotten put in front of the scenes. But I w- in college, I just always thought I would be behind the scenes working. Hasn't really worked out that way. Well, we're glad it worked out the way it did. Um, this next question is from, uh, I might not be able to pronounce all these names right, so we'll give it my best shot here. I believe it's Stefania Sandu. And Stefania wants to know, what do you think of Halloween? Is it okay for Christians to celebrate and to go with the kids for trick or treat? I'm going to answer this, but let me put a little bit of a spoiler. If you have kids listening right now, just pause it for about a couple minutes till they exit the room. But yes, in my family, we do Halloween. I love Halloween. It's a fun time for the imagination and kids. This year, my little girl wanted to be Laura Ingalls, and my little boy who's three wants to be uh, Davy Crockett. And I love it. But also, I just had somebody recently share a neat story that on Halloween— It's one of the few times in our country we open up our doors and our front uh, doors to people that we don't even know. Right. Because you think how often you go down your neighborhood and you have no idea. Some people don't even know their next door neighbor, much less the house, you know, five houses down or 10 houses down. Our society has been so closed off. You go down streets now, people's curtains are closed. This is the one holiday we open up our doors and strangers can walk up our driveway and down. So not that that's a biblical answer. But yes, we do Halloween, but we also do Santa Claus. And I love Christmas. I'm just going to go into that and just, yeah, my kids, they don't get presents if they don't believe in Santa. Everything is signed from Santa. <laughs> and um, That's a bonus question because no, nobody bonus. submitted that question. So you just volunteered No, that, but it's so. a soapbox of mine. Yeah. You know why? Because I grew up with three older brothers. They were way older. So they built in the surprise of the fun imagination part of Christmas. And I had somebody recently ask me, well, when you found out that Santa wasn't real, didn't that mess up with your faith in Jesus, that your parents had been lying to you about Jesus the whole time? No, it did not. I still <laughs> believe in Jesus Christ. So Santa is just a fun time for kids' and imaginations to go wild. And what about with Halloween? Does it, do you have an opinion on the types of costumes that kids use? You know, growing up, my mom never allowed us to be a witch or anything of that manner. And I've kind of followed in those same uh, guidelines with my kids. Yeah, Laura Ingalls and Davy Crockett. I mean, <laughs> there we go. <laughs> yeah. And I might be Betsy Ross just to oh, add on this that's year. that's good. That's good. All right. Anna wants to know about prayer and Bible study. Uh, she says they're hard to find. it's hard to find a daily routine for this sometimes, especially with little ones. So she's asking what has worked for you and for you and your husband. Anna, I would say this has been such a hard subject for me personally in the last couple of years as I've been really busy working and traveling, and I am a mom of young little ones, and I kind of have this ideal of what I want my 
daily devotional to be like. I want it to have my cup of coffee in my hand. I want to wake up and sit in the same spot in my house in the quietness, and it's just me and the Lord. Like an Instagram photo. Exactly. And that is not my reality of the stage of life I'm in. And one day that stage might come, but it's not now. And I have found myself grabbing my Bible as I go out the door. And while I'm sitting in the carpool line, waiting for my kids to get out of school, I get 10 to 15 minutes in that carpool line. And that's where I'm having my daily devotional. That is not ideal. It's not the best, but that's sometimes what my day looks like. And as far as my husband and I in our prayer life, I would have to be honest Our lives are very unconventional and we're on the go all the time. And we don't really have, we have not in the past had that kind of prayer life. And I have noticed that that's been a big struggle of ours. And just in the recent month, my husband and I said, we have a crazy lifestyle. He goes, I go, we have to be more intentional together. Intentional in our conversations, our intentional in our time with our children, intentional in our prayer life together. And I've been on a work trip for the last five days, and I've been so much more intentional on this trip, calling him, praying with him at night. So I can't say I have a perfect example of what that looks like. But right now, the theme in my life and my husband's life is intentional, and we're really working on it. Um, And as far as a daily devotional in different stages of life, I think God will give you the wisdom, but you do what you can Mm -hmm. and just spend a little bit of time of Jesus, and it's going to look different every day in different stages. Yeah. I know your transparency is appreciated and is also really helpful. So on behalf of everyone listening, we'll say a big thank you. Um, Jill wants to know about faith in the college classroom, and she knows that you've talked about it on Fearless before in a previous episode. But to dig into that deeper, she asks the question, how do we raise our children in the public school as a light for Jesus? And is there a time where we need to consider homeschooling or private school? I think when it comes to education, you have to look at each year differently. You have to look at your children. You have to look at the school system um, and just kind of decide on a year-to-year basis. For me in this year, we decided to put my little girl in private school. I never thought I would do that. It's a financial sacrifice to put our kids in a private Christian school. It's something that we've had to pray about and think about and um, make changes in our lifestyle to be able to put her there. I do know that a lot of people can't afford a Christian private school. So many people are homeschooling now. Um, Some people criticize for homeschooling private school that we shouldn't take Christian kids out of school systems, that they should be a light in the world. Um, But our school systems have changed and they've changed a lot and they've become uh, anti-God. The curriculum's a little bit different. The um, sex education that they're teaching now has changed. So I do think you have to look at it On a state level, in your county, what public schools look like. You have to look at your individual child when you're making this decision. Is your child able to stand strong? Is your child bold in their faith? Or is your child a follower that could be very dangerous for them? So there's no right or wrong answer. You have to look at your family. You have to look at your school system that you're in and what you're capable of doing. There's great public schools. There's some great private schools. And there's great homeschool opportunities now that are so different than they used to be. Yeah, that's what my wife and I did with our children is every year, every school system that they were in and made decisions based on the child and and in the circumstances that year. Yeah. Uh, So Miss Pencilette from Instagram, she has put a smiley face beside her question. And her question is, what's your Meyer Briggs personality type? Well, I think the name Miss Pencilette would probably say what her Meyer Briggs (laughs) felt like she would be a very creative person. Um, I do not know my Myers-Briggs personality. I also don't know my Enneagram number, which that probably tells people who do know those things what my Enneagram number is if I don't Uh, know it. Right. So I don't know any of those. I don't either. I mean, I don't know yours or mine. So Uh, next question. A couple of these uh, go together here, Sissy. One is, what was one of your favorite memories with your grandfather, Billy Graham? And then somebody else asked, I would love to know your memories of your grandmother, Ruth. So many people have the memories of my grandfather on a world stage or these pictures that they've seen with presidents and dignitaries and kings and queens and preaching behind the pulpit. And I have those memories at those events with him. But when I think when you grow up in a family that's in the spotlight and it wasn't normal, it was a very unconventional life uh, being in the spotlight. I think for me, 
that I hold on to those moments that were normal because for us it was Thanksgiving was probably my favorite holiday in our home Mm -hmm. because especially when I was little, it was my Aunt Anne's family and our family that really spent Thanksgiving every year with my grandparents. And that was our tradition. My mom and Aunt Anne would do the cooking. And it was fun. The table, there was a lot of laughter and humor. And But the most important thing is we would go around the table and share what we'd been thankful for, what God had done in our life that year. And those were the sweetest, most intimate time in our family. And that is what I miss the most. Um, And I love when my grandfather... He would walk into the room, and he had a very soft voice at home. It wasn't this big voice that you'd seen behind the pulpit. He had very soft, and his eyes would light up. If it was me or anybody else in the family, you know, his eyes would just light up, and all he would want to do is hold your hand, Mm -hmm. and he would kiss you and love on you and just hold your hand. Those are the moments I miss, those normal moments. Because I didn't grow up with a grandfather that was coming to my baseball games or my soccer games. I didn't have a grandfather that was, you know, teaching me stuff out in the driveway. He was a busy man that was on the go all the time. So for my favorite memories, I cling to those normal moments. And I think my favorite memories of my grandmother, we call her Tete. And that means old lady in Chinese. My grandmother grew up in China, so her name was Tete to us. And she was so funny. If you've read anything about her, you know she was full of humor and wit, and she was creative in everything that she did, even raising her children. You know, when my dad would be disobedient or do something bad, she would throw him in the trunk of the car (laughs) and drive around. She even went through the drive-thru, ordered him a hamburger, and put it in the trunk of the car with him and closed it. Or I can remember one time she she was going to the airport to pick up my grandfather, and she was speeding and got pulled over uh, by a police officer. And after she got the ticket, she goes, well, which direction are you going, officer? Because now I really have to speed because I'm late. <laughs> so she was just uh, just full of, I mean, she was just a funny lady and yeah. everybody loved being around her. What I loved about going to her house and some of the most special memories is she used to do like scavenger hunts for us. Okay. Very creative. She would write out like the scavenger hunt in the paper and she would hide things throughout her house and you would have to find them. Yeah. And she also would cook, bake cakes. My grandmother, she really couldn't cook very well and she Uh wasn't a great baker, but she would bake cakes and she would call them surprise cakes and she would bake things inside the cake whether it was like charms or like a piece of jewelry or something. So you got to be careful chewing (laughs) because you might break a tooth. Or if she gave us a present, this is something I love. She would take like 100 toilet paper rolls that she had collected. She would put the money or the check inside the toilet paper roll, put all of those rolls in one big box and wrap them up, and you had to find your check inside of them. (laughs) So she was just funny. Those are my favorite yeah. memories that I miss most about my grandmother. Yeah, that's neat because I haven't heard a lot of those stories, but I've heard other funny stories about your grandmother. And it, I mean, she had a great sense of humor from from everything we hear. That's for sure. Um, OK, someone else asks the question, how do you win over family members who have no interest in the Lord? I would say you don't win them. You love them. And family situations can be very difficult, even when you do all know the Lord, much less when you don't. And I would just say you love them. Sometimes there's going to be maybe hard conversations that come up around the dinner table or different life situations. I would say don't let Satan use that in your life to destroy your heart and your attitude towards that person. Uh, Deal with it and move on. Always show love and always show grace in the conversation. It doesn't mean never to take a stand if that you're in a I'm just going to make up a scenario. But if you are in a conversation with them and they're saying something that, you know, is totally false or untrue, you can correct them. You can do it in a loving way and say what you believe and how you believe it. Always keep loving them. They can not they will never be able to use anything against you if you're always loving Mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. And this is a timely question with Thanksgiving coming up like in a month, because a lot of times Thanksgiving brings together members of the family who don't spend a lot of time together and people have a lot of different opinions on things, right? So this is a good opportunity to practice what you're what you're talking about there. Yeah, it's just, I mean, serve them, love on them when they need it. And, you know, God will open up those opportunities to share his love with them. Um, Jacqueline for Jake on Instagram says, I'm a pastor's wife, school teacher, and our kids are 15 and 17 and life is busy. When you were a teenager or young adult, Sissy, what would you say were the most impactful things that your parents did that encouraged you in your faith? 
I'll give one example, and my parents did many things. But as I've gotten older, I realized there was something in my parents that they did every day in our lives. And that was we prayed together as a family. My dad, when he was home, he traveled a lot. But when he was home, we always had nightly devotions together as a family. And the nighttime can be very busy for parents. You're cleaning up the kitchen after you cooked. For me, I got little ones, so I'm trying to bathe them. I really don't like nighttime. I just want the kids to get in bed so I can get in bed. Um, but I'm trying to be more intentional with that because my parents did this, and I think it was so instrumental in our life, is that every night we had Bible study with my dad, and he made it fun. You know, like he made learning scripture fun. And then we all got on our knees as a family, and we went around the circle, and we prayed together as a family. And I think that had a huge impact in our lives. So for this lady that's got a 15-year-old and a 17-year-old, you got your time with your family in your home for a very short time before they go off to college. Pray together. Use your kitchen table as your mission field with them. Because I know it's busy. They're probably playing sports or doing stuff, extra activities. Just be intentional with that time and conversation, but ultimately pray with them together. Okay, the next question takes a a different direction. They ask, they say, I admire and appreciate your godly life so much, but can you share any health and diet tips that you and Corey use? (laughs) I have never been asked that before. Um, Thank you. I'm very flattered. Uh, For Corey, when Corey got injured in the NFL and he worked out for another year and a half, uh, trying to get back into the NFL. But the day he decided to 100% retire, he has never worked out a day in his life. (laughs) I can remember his last day in the gym because we were in there together. And so I tease him all the time. He said he worked out his whole life. He's done it enough. He's over it. And I tease him because I think he used to get paid to work out. And now he's not going to pay to go work out. (laughs) But for me, I mean, I do work out when I can. It's a busy schedule. I have no diet tips. Part of it goes back to my episode where I shared with my eating disorder is I've never gone back to a diet because I was afraid I would get too obsessive over it. I don't eat a lot of sweets. I'd rather have potato chips than anything else. But um, I think you don't keep a scale either. I don't have a scale. Yeah. Um, But we do eat fairly healthy. I I can't give any tips. I'm not a professional (laughs) on that. Sorry. (laughs) All right. Um, Here's a more spiritual question then maybe. Um, Faith in the workplace. How to live it out in a liberal environment. I feel very fortunate because I have never had to work in a secular environment. I've worked for my dad since I got out of college, but I can say I never take that for granted. And I encourage my colleagues when we come here at the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association or for those at Samaritan's Purse, when we open up our day with staff devotions and prayer, that is so powerful and never to take it for granted because there's so many people out there in a corporate and secular world, right. that it is very difficult to live out your faith. Yeah. But I do have a husband that worked in a very hard environment in the NFL. And I don't want to bash the NFL, but the locker room could be a very hard and vulgar and uh, corrupt atmosphere. And it was for him to have an unwavering faith. And that's what I would encourage this person is you live your life and it's unwavering. Set the example. You live your life apart from the world. Your colleagues are going to notice if you don't curse. They're going to notice if you don't do certain things that the world does and live your life apart from the world. But always to be loving with them, have lunch with them, encourage them, ask questions of how they grew up and build relationships with them because you have to build the relationship before you can get the influence in their life to share God's love. And I just would encourage you is to stand strong and unwavering, but always to do it in love and grace. But ultimately, it's not what I say. Pray that the Lord and the Holy Spirit would show you how to live out that life. I remember what Corey said in that episode about being liked versus being respected. Yeah, I think when you live this life of an unwavering faith, and sometimes you have to take a stand in your uh, workplace, they might not always like you, Mm -hmm. but they will respect you. Right. But with that comes is like you have to take an unwavering stand all the time. Yeah, you have to be really be very careful mm -hmm. how you live your life around non-believers. Right. To not be a stumbling block to those. Because if you're not consistent, then they won't respect you. It's that um, that consistent living out of your faith. Yeah. Let's see, Um, Karen asks, this is a this is a good question, how to deal with all the negativity surrounding your and your dad's and your brother's ministries? A, f- a few people have, have asked about that. 
Um, you know, Karen points out that folks like to hurl untruths and assume they, they know your family or know things about their, your family or motives and their political involvement. So talk about that. I can honestly say growing up, I never read one article about my dad or my grandfather. I just decided at a young age that I didn't need to know any of that. I knew who they were in my life. I knew them the best, you know, because I had a personal relationship with them. I didn't need to know what the world said about them. I think in today's time, it's a little different with social media. It makes it a little bit harder. Um, Twitter can be the nastiest place you can go to. It's full of hateful, hurtful people. Um, But us grams have really thick skin. And my grandparents and my parents set that example for us that it really never bothers me because I don't have to answer to them. I don't have to answer to the world. Um, I have to answer to God. And the thing that hurts the most, I would say, or I shouldn't say hurts, that bothers me the most are when people say my dad's hateful Mm -hmm. because you never have met a more compassionate, loving man who is – uh, shows so much grace to those around him, um, whether it's at work or different scenarios. But so that would have a hard time when they take the things he says out of context or says he's a hateful person that's just not true. But other than that, we have really thick skin and none of it seems to really bother me. That's good. Dee Dee um, is asking about your mom. She says, can you tell us a little bit about your mom? I don't see much of her regarding ministry. I hope to get my mom on the podcast one day. I describe my mom as one of the wisest women I know. She came to know Christ through my grandmother. My grandmother led her to Christ when her and my dad, um, after they got engaged. But my mom gives biblical and practical advice. So I'm trying to get her on here for a series of two. My sister-in-law and brother, they just got out of the military and her friends say, we really miss you, but we really miss Jane because (laughs) she's always given them advice for raising children or how to be, you know, wife. So everybody misses my mom. They love my mom. We hope to get her on here one day. Yeah, yeah. You talked about your mom growing up and how she was kind of a mom to all the kids in the neighborhood, right? My mom, I say, is a mom that was there. She was at every soccer game, every volleyball game, uh, wrestling match for my brother. She didn't miss anything, and she was very involved in our lives. And my dad traveled a lot, so my mom said, I'm not going to travel with him. I think sometimes she would receive criticism for not traveling with him as much. But her job was to raise her family, and my dad was so thankful for that. And she stayed home and kept us grounded and just helped us live a normal life. Yeah. And um, I'm very thankful for that, that she decided to do that. Because we and live she, in a culture that women want to go to work and do all this, and mm-hmm. I work. I can't say anything about that. But she made the sacrifice. Well, she wouldn't call it a sacrifice, but she raised her family. And she really followed in the footsteps of your grandmother, Ruth, right? That's what that's what your grandmother did. And grand, your grandmother, Ruth, had a big influence in your mom's life. Yeah. I always, my mom says my grandmother was her best friend. Mm-hmm. My, like I said earlier, my grandmother led my mom to Christ, but I think they had so much in common. My mom's really down to earth and really funny and um, just can be practical lady. And you feel like you've known my mom all your life if you sit down with her for five minutes. Yeah. And so her, I always said her ministry was at home and with at the office, um, especially Samaritan's Purse, because it was in Boone where we grew up, is her ministry was with our, our staff. Um, my, the staff love my mom. She's good. And that's kind of her ministry. Yeah. I'm looking forward to having her on the, on the if podcast. If we can talk her into it. She doesn't yes. like to be in the limelight. <laughs> Okay, so um, this question is another one you, you, you've already talked about a little bit, and that is sharing your faith. Um, they say one of the biggest reasons I hold back is because I'm afraid of coming across too intense and pushing people away from the faith. You mentioned in your first podcast that we are a culture that is easily offended, and I'm sometimes afraid to mention the gospel for fear that it would do more damage than good. I'd love to hear your take on that. I think you have to remember that being a Christian, you will offend people. And it's not what you say, it's how you say it. So as in all my podcasts, I remind you to live a life full of grace, but full of truth. And that doesn't mean we back down and we shouldn't shy shy away from the things that we believe or taking a stand in with a Christian worldview when the world is trying to have us politically correct all the time or say something. So don't um, cater to the world, but always stand on God's scripture and God's truth. But don't be afraid of offending people. You are going to offend people. The scripture is offensive. 
Because what it does is if you're sharing the gospel with somebody and the truth of the gospel, you have to talk about sin. And people don't want to talk about sin in their life. It's offensive because you're calling out what they've done wrong in their life, and nobody wants to talk about sin. Um, But that's the gospel. You can't have the love of Christ without dealing with the sin in your life. And so it's going to be offensive. And even scripture in John 15, it says, if the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you are of the world, the world will love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. And I think of when John the Baptist was beheaded, and I don't want to scare this lady (laughs) in the beheading story, but what he did was he took a bold stand and he called out Herod who was living a life of adultery. He had um, taken his brother's wife as his own. And John the Baptist called him out on it. And his wife didn't like it. And she um, called for the head of John the Baptist. And the point of that is the world doesn't like it when we call out sin. But just know who to keep your eyes fixed on. And that's Jesus. And be encouraged by Jesus that he is coming back. And I want to encourage you that for me in my life, I've really I've just started studying the book of Revelation kind of in a deeper way, because I think in this world, we're afraid of offending people or we're going to be persecuted in different areas and different ways. We have to have this um, our eyes fixed on Jesus and what is to come and this heavenly mindset that Jesus will return. And it will be so easy to be scared and to kind of live in fear and be afraid that we're going to offend people. But Jesus says we will. The gospel is offensive because we have to talk about sin. And I just want to encourage you that live in grace and truth, but never be afraid to offend people. Well, here's an interesting segue from marriage. You were just talking about marriage. This woman is saying that she is soon to be married and she would love to hear about married life as a Christian. That could be a whole podcast in itself Mm -hmm. about married life. Let me just give my number one advice to being a wife, and that is to be your husband's number one cheerleader. Mm. And I've learned that in different stages of my life. But as a wife, your husband needs encouragement every single day. So be your husband's number one cheerleader. Um, Okay. Now, this uh, person, they say I have three kids, seven and under. And as the rampant increase in the worldly view of homosexuality and how our kids are being constantly exposed to this particular sin, I would love to hear how you answer your kids' questions about the issue or how you plan to answer them when it comes up. Oh, man, I'll be praying of how I answer that question because it is so hard. And it's happening at a younger age. Uh, Even our school systems now, because it's become socially acceptable in the world, now it's telling our kindergartens and first graders that that's, you know, truth. You can look at uh, different. I just know in uh, California, there was a teacher that just passed out for seventh and eighth graders this chart of like get to know you on the first day. And it was this purple unicorn on sexual identity. Mm for seventh and eighth graders. So it is getting very difficult. And he said he was not Mr. So-and-so. I don't know his last name, but he introduced himself as MX with his last name, Mix. I don't I don't know what that would even mean. Can't keep up with it right now all the days. But my point is it's going to get harder and harder. And I don't know if I have the right answer right now because it's something that the Holy Spirit is going to have to reveal to a parent to how to always go back to truth. In the love of Christ. For me, I do have a six-year-old girl that when we pass this one church all the time, they have the rainbow flag flying. And she is at, she thought it was so cool and so beautiful that the rainbow flag was flying at the church. And I had to somehow explain that to her in a way that she might understand as a little girl. Right. And that was very difficult, but I just used the story of Noah and And why God gave us the rainbow is because people were living a sinful life that didn't love God and disobeyed God and um, told her the story of Noah and the ark and that God placed the rainbow in the clouds as a sign of his love that he would never flood the earth again. And I just explained it that way. And for now, that's all we have to do, Mm -hmm. that some people use the rainbow to represent things that dishonor God, but to remind her what the true meaning of the rainbow is. Right, right. So... I don't know if that's a clear answer, but for now in the stage of life we're in, that's how I've answered to my six-year-old. 
Okay, so see, we have a couple questions about uh, Bible versions and translations. Um, questions like, which version or translation of the Bible do you read? I know it's a personal preference, this person says, but I was just curious. Someone else says they struggle to understand the King James Version of Scripture. Um, and so folks are looking for some guidance on versions and translations. Well, I'm not saying I'm right. I actually lately have been reading different versions for different reasons. My go-to is NIV. Now, to be honest, my grandmother would not approve of that. She called that the nearly inspired version. (laughs) (laughs) Um, She was a King James. My grandfather was King James, but that's because that's all they had back then. Um, I've talked to my brother and he does New King James. And some of the pastors that I follow do New King James. So I have started reading some of New King James. And my brother said it's just because... The first commentary that all came out was based on King James Version. So to get the closest to that without reading the King James Version and getting the commentary. That makes but sense. my brother has taught me that everything is efficient. Everything is sufficient when it comes to translations. It's all going to get the job done. You're all going to hear the gospel and can come to know the Lord through them all. Mm-hmm. So as Christians, let's don't get worried on which translation's right and what's not. Don't let that divide us. I have been uh, reading the NASB, which I think is probably the most literal and most accurate. But I will say the Living Bible and the Message is not a translation. It's a paraphrase, and I would not recommend the two of those. And the beauty is there are so many translations available. I mean, you can read, you can go online and read multiple translations, multiple versions of, of the same passage. And I do that all the time. Yeah. I, if I'm, especially if I'm teaching on something or using scripture, I will look at the different ways and different translations. Well, so that's all the questions we have time for, for this episode. You covered a lot of ground though. Well, thank you for everybody that submitted the fun ones, yeah. the more serious ones. And if we didn't get to it, hopefully... Maybe in the future we can. Yeah, we might do get another episode of, like this, right? Yeah, that yeah. was awesome. Thank you for everybody that participated and submitted questions. And Phil, thank you for being with me today. That was fun. It was fun. It is so much more fun to have a colleague at the table with you to do a podcast and having to sit here and do it by yourself. Oh, it was fun being here. Look forward to the next question and answer episode. I am so glad Phil was able to join me today. It just made it so much more fun. Just so you know, Phil is part of another podcast here at BGA. It's called GPS, God People Stories. And I encourage you to listen to it. It tells the stories of people who've seen God work an amazing way in their lives. And you can listen to it by going to billygramradio.org. Thanks again for listening to this episode. Stay connected on Instagram, Facebook and Twitter. I'm Sissy Graham Lynch. Oh,